I hope uh, Fevruta learning went well. Um, we're going to start now with the Gemara. So as we saw, I know there were a few questions asked about the Mishnah, and the truth is the Mishnah is quite complicated in light of what we know to be because it doesn't say anything about salt water. In fact, some people say it's water or vinegar. It's not even so clear. The salt water seems to have developed later. And as we saw, there's no parsley there or potatoes or anything like that. Again, it could be that it, it means that it could be also that. Um, but now we're going to get to the Gemara. So Rish Lakish's first line is a big boom. And then, like I said, this comes a little bit out of the blue. And this happens very often where someone will read a source and say, wait, I'm going to infer from this something. And the question is going to be, is this really what's inferred from the Mishnah or not? Is this the only way to read the Mishnah? So Amar Rish Lakish, Zot Omeret Mitzvot Srichot Kavana. He says, we can prove from our Mishnah that Mitzvot Ni Kavana. So the first thing I want to show you is what the Masoret Hashas is. I put this as an advanced question. No, not everybody knows what this is. But if you look here in the Gemara, there's, I'm going to open it to the side that we're looking at. There's a little teeny olive there. Okay, it's, I'll try to make it big here on the screen. It's in red here, circled. It's a little olive. That olive, these are all coded, the Gemara. There's different fonts. Okay, this existed before fonts was, were a big deal. They tried to differentiate different types of letters. So this little olive next to the words mitzvot sricho kavana sends you to Masorah Shas, which is in the upper, this side, this page is going to be on the upper left corner. And it tells you where else in the Gemara you can find this topic of mitzvot needing kavana. Okay, so here it says, for example, it's in Bracha Yud Gimel and it's in Eruvin Tzadi Hey. These are the things that as you get older, it's not so easy to read these little teeny prints in the Gemara, but you know, there's good, there's the advantage of having on your screen, you can always zoom in and see it in big letters. Okay, that's just an aside. Before we get now to the Gemara, which as I warned you was a little bit complicated, I want to talk first about the sources I brought at the very end, which I assume most of you did not get to. But I brought them here and I bring, I bring a lot of sources, even though I know you're not going to necessarily have time to read it, because I hope that those who have time, I know not everybody does, and if you give to this class an hour and 15 minutes a week, it's great. But if you have more time, you can always read these sources on your own. So this, the, these sources really get into, and these are achronim. Achronim are the much later commentaries. In fact, Rav Asher Weiss is living still nowadays. Um, and the question really becomes, what is kavana? Where'd we get this idea that mitzvot would need kavana? Now, you might say it's quite obvious. And in fact, that's what Rav Asher Weiss says. He says here, mishum kach nireh. The root of the debate, whether they need or whether they don't need, okay, svara, and what I wanted to bring this is because this is a classic argument between him and the next source we're going to see. Do you learn things based on logic because it's just obvious? Or do you learn them, do, they, do we always try to say, oh, this comes from a verse in the Torah? So he says, this is just pure logic that you need intent to do a mitzvah. Why is that? So he says, I'm skipping to line two. De kasher ein kavana ha mitzvah. If you don't have kavana for the mitzvah, ein kan kol chafsa shel avodat Hashem. What is a mitzvah? A mitzvah is a way of worshiping God. Well, there's no such thing as worshiping God without intent. What does that mean? Ve ein bezashem mitzvah ukimit asiku. And he starts to use language that those who learn Masechet Shabbat should be familiar with this, which is it's just like you did an action that caused something else, and you weren't even really intending whatsoever. And when it comes to Shabbat, we don't consider that a malacha. And he quotes the very famous machloka in Masechet Shabbat. Anyone who learned Masechet Shabbat will probably remember this. You don't need any sort of drasha to teach you. Rabbi Shimon holds, if you do an action on Shabbat, you weren't intending to do a malacha, you were intending to do something else. But while you were doing something else, you did a malacha. Now you weren't intending to do any sort of Malacha, malacha is forbidden work on Shabbat. So he says, just like you didn't need an argument to prove that, basically an action without intent is not an action. So likewise, he's going to basically take that to Shabbat, to our case. A mitzvah without intent is not a mitzvah. Okay? And therefore he says, yadanu Right, a mitzvah has to be done by a person. There's a human nature to it. it. The mitzvah just happens on its own. You don't get the mitzvah. So he basically says, therefore we know, and, and you could call this a legal answer. 
part of what we learn in Gemara is that Gemara is a legal document. We're trying to come up with a legal system. If you want to count something as a mitzvah, just like you want to count something as work on Shabbat, it has to be that you had some sort of intention. Without intention, it's nothing. So he says it's all svara. Okay, that's logic. But, Hara, but the Bnei Yisachar, okay, he was living, lived in Poland in the beginning of the 19th century. He says that we learn it from a Pasuk, and he quotes the Levush, who's a, also an Achron, who, commenter, who is a commentator on the Shulchan Ruch. And he says that we learn it from Mikha Yalif. We learn it from a verse in the Torah. He quotes the Levush as saying this, and it's kind of funny, because he says he didn't exactly explain, Lobi er makom ha he didn't say what Pasuk. And then he tells us to look, he explains to us that the Levush says, go look in Siman Tav Kuf Pei Tet. And also there, he doesn't say it, okay? He doesn't explain, sorry, there's a space missing here. Gam Sham Lo Biel. He also didn't explain it there, okay? So and as he sent him on a wild goose chase to kind of find this verse, but the Levush in the end doesn't really say where. So he tries to think about where it could be from. There's a few verses, and he quotes one in Parshat Kitavo. Okay, God commanded you on this day, God commanded you about all the mitzvot, and you should do them. What does he say? He, I didn't even know how to translate this into English, so I actually left it out. What he says is, I didn't know how to put this into words, but I'll explain it. I'll try to explain it now. What he says is, to do a mitzvah, it has to be done. Think about it. A mitzvah has to be done with passion, with your heart, with your soul. If it's not with your heart and your soul, then it then it's nothing. And he he takes it out of the whole legal framework. It has nothing to do with legal. This isn't doesn't have to do with Masechet Shabbat and not intending. This is something. What is a mitzvah without your heart and soul? If your heart and soul isn't in it, that's not a mitzvah. Now this is a little bit. It sounds very beautiful, but it's a little bit hard to swallow because we all know that we do mitzvot all the time and we don't always have our heart and soul into it. And we're not always thinking about, you know, how much we are intending. And that's why I brought at the end here, the Mishnabura, again, I'm diverting a little just to kind of zoom out of the topic. And then we're gonna zoom in and see what the Gemara has to say, but the Gemara doesn't deal with this really. The Gemara just assumes this is topic, mitzvot srichot kavana. And what I wanna do is understand what is this kavana? So we have one is a legal kind of terminology that without intent, your action is not an action. Or specifically when it comes to mitzvot, you need to be, your heart and soul have to be in it. Otherwise it's not a mitzvah. So the Mishnah Brura, which is written by the Chavetz Chaim in 19th century Russia, he says that basically he says there's two intents for a mitzvah. One is in the heart for the mitzvah itself, which is kind of like the Bnei Yisachar says. And one is the intention to fulfill one's obligation that God commanded us, okay? Which is more like you need intend to do the mitzvah, right? Which is more like what Rav Asher Weiss was saying. And he says here that basically in the end, he makes this distinction, and I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but he says that it seems that to fulfill a mitzvah in its best form, then you really need full intent with your heart and with your soul. But if you do a mitzvah without that, you're clearly going to fulfill your mitzvah anyway, okay? And that's why he says, there's these exceptions to the rule, which is the first verse of Shema, okay, on the third line here, he says, the first verse of Shema, the first blessing of Shema and Esrei, there is a unique exception that one really needs to have full intent with your heart and everything, but your mind on it, but really when it comes to all of the mitzvot, yes, it's ideal, but we don't really go by the Bnei Sachar in terms of does one really have to do this? So that's just a little bit of practical. Now I want to get back to the Gemara. So now the Gemara started off, as we said, Rish Lakish said, mitzvot srichot kavana. Okay, we can infer this from the Mishnah. Now we have no idea yet where we can infer that from the Mishnah. Okay, so now, the next line of the Gemara starts to explain and we're gonna get into it in parts. Kevan de lo be'idan chiyuva de maro, hu de achile, be'bore pri ha'adama, hu de achile. Okay, it says two things here. Number one, okay, you can see here, this is good tactics with Gemara. I actually read it incorrectly right now. So I'll, I'll correct myself and I'll show you what I did wrong. Now notice the words huda achile. I've mentioned this in past year. And when you see something repeated, that's an indicator that there's kind of two lines going on here. And bubore pri ha'adama huda achile. You see the same words appear. Okay, so let's stop for a minute and explain these words. Since when you eat, what he's pointing out is that the chazeret is mentioned in the first dipping and the chazeret's mentioned in the second dipping. So he says, 
since you're not eating the chazeret in the beginning of the Seder at a time when you're supposed to eat maror, that means it's not the time of the chiyuv of maror when you're eating it. And that's number one. Number two, what's the blessing we say on karpas, if you remember? We just say, we don't say any blessing like we say on the maror. What do we say on the maror? Al achilat maror. I'm making a bracha, asher kirishanu b'mitzvotav etzivanu, that God commanded me to fulfill the mitzvah of eating maror. So since, number one, I didn't eat it for maror. Number two, right? I didn't eat it at the time when I'm doing maror. And number two, I didn't make a boroi priyadama. I'm sorry, I only made a boroi priyadama. The dilma, now this dilma is a very strange use of the word dilma. Okay, I'll correct it in a minute. But dilma means perhaps lo ichaven lemaror. Perhaps one didn't intend maro when they were eating the chazeret. Now, this is not a perhaps. This is clearly, when you're eating karpas of a seder, did you ever think maybe I'm being, I'm going to eat, mar- maybe this will fulfill my obligation of maro? Of course you weren't thinking about maro. It's not the time of the seder for maro. And you didn't say the bracha, ala chilat maro. So comes Rish Lakish and he says, therefore, what do you see here? Therefore, you have to go back and dip a second time for the purposes of maror. Now, what do you see from here? Okay, so let's keep going. If you think that mitzvah don't need intent, then let's say I'm eating my chazeret. At the beginning of the seder, I dip it. So I've done what I need to do for maror, technically speaking. I've eaten this chazeret, which counts for maror. I've eaten, I've dipped it, which is also something you're supposed to do for maror. And I made a blessing. I didn't make an ala chilat maror, but who cares? I don't need kavana. By the way, you don't need to make a bracha to fulfill a mitzvah. If you do a mitzvah without making the bracha, you actually can't make the bracha after because you've already fulfilled your mitzvah and you, now it becomes a, a, a necessary bracha. So he says like this, the fact that they mentioned chazeret twice shows you that if you didn't need intent, right? this is what we call the process of elimination argument. If you didn't need intent, why would I have needed to dip twice? I already dipped it once before. And if I don't need intent to fulfill the mitzvah, I did the exact same act, right? What did I do? I dipped something. It was a vegetable that counts for maror and I ate it. So that would fulfill your obligation of maror. So comes Rish Lakish and he says, clearly mitzvah must not need kavana. Okay, so I asked here a question for you to think about, which is, do you think, that that's a necessary, like I said about my meal, you know, I ate dairy, right? Was that necessarily that you have to assume I'm vegetarian? Not necessarily. One could explain that this has nothing to do with mitzvot srichot kavana. So that's the next line of the Gemara. So this is the classic example, which happens very often in the Gemara. Somebody reads the Gemara and is, reads the Mishnah, makes an assumption. And then the Gemara says, is that really an accurate assumption? Mimai, why are you assuming this? Dilma laola mitzvot en srichot kavana. Maybe really mitzvot don't need intent. Okay, so what are we left to explain then? Why do we need to dip the chazera two times? Utekahamalta tre By the way, this is where it's clear, even though it was a little strange in the Mishnah, it said dip it into the chazera. It wasn't really clear, but it's clear that they mean dip the chazera, even though the wording doesn't match that. And now, so why do you need two dippings? Let's go back to last week's class. This is, I mentioned last week, anytime they don't know why something is there at the Seder, their answer is, their go-to answer is, oh, it must be so the children ask. Okay, so they now say, maybe really you don't need to dip twice because really you could fulfill maror in the beginning of the Seder when you dip that chazeret even though you didn't intend because you don't need intent to fulfill a mitzvah. But he says, maybe anyway, we do it so that the children will ask. And that's why we have two dippings. Okay, possible suggestion. Okay, so here I filled in the chart so you could see, you could check your answers, right? The mitzvah requirement to have Rish Lakish says yes. The rejection obviously says no, right? So why do you need to dip it? Either because you didn't intend in the first time or you, we don't need intention, but it's just so the children will ask. Okay. Now, the Gemara is going to bring up a Bechi Tema. Bechi Tema is a suggestion that's going to immediately be rejected. Bechi Tema literally means, and when you say, meaning if you're going to come to me and say, wait, 
I can prove from the Mishnah that Rish Lakish is right. Why? Because if really mitzvot didn't need intent, then in ken on sha'ar yirakot, why did it specifically say, right? Think about it. Karpas, you can use any kind of vegetable. Why did it specifically choose chazeret? So now they're going to say, if the Mishnah had used the words other vegetables, instead of, for some reason I couldn't add the word here, but instead of chazeret, then we would have understood the reason for two dippings was so that the children will ask. So therefore, if Rish Lakish was right, that the purpose of it was to teach Mitzrot require intent, it should have used other vegetables instead of that. Okay, so now, uh, one second, this sounds confusing the way I wrote it, no? If Rish Lakish, right, if that's the case, the Mishnah should have taught us other vegetables. Um, one second, and then, Right, so now they're going to say like this. So if, one second, I just got confused for one quick minute. If we're going to say, one second. Um, I'm going to say, right, uh, now, uh, sorry, I got confused for one quick minute. Okay, if the idea was that the children are going to ask, then it should have used the word other vegetables because it doesn't matter if it's chazeret or other vegetables. The point is we want to have two dippings. That's the whole idea. Generally, we have to understand in those days, what would they do? So I, the, um, I read an interesting commentary that poor people would dip before their meal. They would have vegetables to fill themselves up and rich people would do it to whet their appetites. So the idea is if the whole idea is that tonight we're doing something different and we're dipping twice rather than just once, then it should have just used other vegetables. Why did it use chazeret specifically? to teach you this idea about mitzvot tzrichot kavana. So now the Gemara says, wait a minute. No, if you want to say that, I'll counter that with something else, which is, if the whole idea is, it's specifically those words were chosen, I'm going to tell you that that's not really true. Because if you had chosen Sha'ar Yerakot, just to teach you that the children will know, right, that there'll be some noticeable difference, then there's something that would have misled us. What would be a misled to think? Hava Amina. Hava Amina means I would have thought. When there's other vegetables, who to be in on tibule? That's the only case where you would need twice. But what would happen if you ate chazeret in the first dipping? Ah, that would. Obviously, you'd be, and as this is against Rish Lakish, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to reject the support. If you use Shari Yerakot, it would have led people to think that one time of eating chazeret would be enough, and you wouldn't need two dippings. Therefore, Kamash Malan, therefore, it has to tell us to chazeret Ah, the whole idea is we want to make sure that you know that even with chazeret, you need two dippings. You might have been mistaken to think, oh, if I eat chazeret and that can count for my maror, perfect. Then I don't need two dippings. But no, if the whole idea is hakeri latino kot, then you actually are going to need both dippings. Okay, so what's our summary? Just to review before we move on to the next section of chavruta, that if you have the need to dip chazeret twice for karpas and maror, that's clear, right? You need that to, the chazeret twice. So this could prove mitzvot srichot kavana, they need intent, because if they didn't require intent, then one could have just dipped once. But then we said, no, 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 it doesn't prove anything because the double dipping could be for the children. And then what about the fact that it mentioned chazeret and not, and not other vegetables? So again, for Rish Lakish, we tried to say maybe that proves specifically chazeret needs two dippings because mitzvot, because mitzvot, um, that I think I wrote this wrong, that specifically the chazeret needs the two dippings. Uh, right, sorry, no, it's right, because mitzvot need kavana, it should be require kavana. Okay, but if we try to prove that it doesn't require kavana, then again, we say it said, it said chazeret specifically because we don't want you to think that if you were to use chazeret, we'd only dip once. No, we need two dippings for the children to ask, whether it's chazeret, whether it's other vegetables, and that's why specifically it said, the, as you say, the chidush, the unique halacha in the mission is even chazeret twice, you'll still have to, you'll still have to um, do it twice because again, we want to get it for the children. So we've proven two ways of reading our Mishnah. One is that the double dipping is to teach you mitzvot need intent. 
And the other is to teach you the mitzvot need, uh, you need double in order for the children to ask, right? I keep thinking of double dipping, right? With people dipping into their food twice. Anyway, not that double dipping. So with that, I'm going to send you into the next chavruta. And the next chavruta is going to bring some Tanaitic sources, because right now we've only been talking about Amoraim. And what we showed before was that the Mishnah doesn't discuss this at all. Right? The Mishnah doesn't talk about the topic of mitzvot tzricho kavana, and it almost sounds like this isn't a topic that the Mishnah deals with. Or maybe anyone in the Tanaitic time period, it was just Rish Lakish, and then the Gemara's response to him, Rish Lakish is an Amorah in Israel living in the, second in the second generation. So now what we want to try to go and prove is that maybe this was also an issue that Tanaim discussed as well. Again, Tanaim is the previous time period when the Mishnah was written, and that's where the Gemara is going to start with, and then it's going to be a bit of a debate. How to read certain sources? Is this what the Mishnah's talk is? This Was this a debate in the time of the Mishnah also or not? With that, I'll send you to Chavruto. We'll do 10 minute Chavruto this time so that we finish in time. And uh, and then we'll regroup. We're going to come back at the end to the idea of Kavana and kind of what's what practically speaking, right? Because even though it's a Gemara Shir, it's a very interesting topic in terms of what is Kavana, what kind of intent, there must be different levels of intent, and we're going to also get into that. Okay, I'll send you to Chavruta now.